I'm going to back up a little bit and go all the way through the nervous system portion of getting a skeletal muscle to contract and then go through the cross bridge cycling again. So this is putting the whole story back together. So um, the question that I'm addressing here um, is how is muscle contraction, specifically skeletal muscle contraction, triggered by the nervous system? We know how the cross bridge cross bridges work and how the sarcomere contracts, but we need to go back and fill in um, the information about how you get this started. So we're going to have to add a few more players in. Um, by the way, this is called excitation contraction coupling, the whole process of getting an action potential started on the skeletal muscle and then getting it to contract. So um, we're going to add in troponin, um, tropomyosin, and calcium in muscle contraction. So first thing, things that you know, um, the axons of a somatic motor neuron must go directly to every single cell in order to get the cell to contract or fiber to contract. So um, this is a somatic motor neuron and this is skeletal muscle. Some terminology to make sure that you've got. Um, the somatic motor neuron, the axon of it, will actually form a synapse with the skeletal muscle fiber and that synapse is actually called a neuromuscular junction, which is a specific type of synapse between a neuron and a muscle fiber. So a neuromuscular junction, which I tend to agree or tend to abbreviate as NMJ. And then of course we know that each individual skeletal muscle fiber must have a direct neural stimulus to contract. But now we're going to talk about what actually happens that causes it to contract. Okay. So we haven't talked about synapses in much detail yet, so this will be your preview of more detail to come in synapses. So the first thing that has to happen is I need to have an action potential go down here and actually release a specific neurotransmitter. And we, we know that the neurotransmitter at skeletal muscle fibers is always acetylcholine. So basically we are going to have an action potential go down to the axon terminals of the somatic motor neuron and acetylcholine is going to be released from the axon terminal. Now the way that that's released, let me just show you an animation about that and you will get this in more detail later. But this is a somatic motor neuron, this is the neuromuscular junction that you're seeing and this is the skeletal muscle fiber. The way that you cause um, the neurotransmitter to be released is when the action potential gets to the axon terminal of the somatic motor neuron, um, it will cause the opening of a voltage-gated calcium channel, and we're still on the neuron here. We're not on the muscle cell, and the voltage-gated calcium channel opening will allow calcium to move in to the axon terminal, and it's the increase in calcium that will cause exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. So I'm gonna show you the beginning of this part for right now. An action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal, causing voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open, increasing the calcium ion, ion channels to open, increasing the calcium ion permeability of the presynaptic terminal cell membrane. Calcium ions enter the presynaptic terminal and cause vesicles to release their neurotransmitter acetylcholine from the synaptic vesicles into the presynaptic cleft. Diffusion of acetylcholine across the synaptic cleft and binding of acetylcholine to acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic muscle fiber membrane causes an increase in the permeability of ligand-gated sodium ion channels. The movement of sodium ions into the muscle cell results in depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. Once threshold has been reached, a postsynaptic action potential is generated and is propagated over the muscle cell membrane. Okay, so that went a little ahead of what we were doing. So basically what we said is in order to get the muscle fiber to contract, you first have to get um, the neurotransmitter released from the nervous system. So in this portion right here, we're still on nervous system. So you get an action potential on the axon terminal of the, of the somatic motor neuron and that causes acetylcholine secretion from the axon terminal because of the opening of those voltage-gated calcium channels and calcium moving into the axon terminal. 
And then if you get that to occur, then um, the acetylcholine, let's go here. Okay, so I got the neurotransmitter to be released. And then the neurotransmitter is always acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is going to bind to the ligand gated sodium channels. They also let a little bit of potassium, but it's primarily sodium that moves um, so to the ligand gated sodium channels, um, which will open the ligand gated sodium channels. And then sodium is going to move in and that's going to cause a depolarization. If you hit threshold for the muscle fiber, then you're going to get an action potential. I'll come back and pick up the rest of these. And the action potential actually goes both directions um, down the muscle. And importantly, because of the anatomy of the muscle, it's not limited to staying on the surface. So let's go to the next figure, okay? So this figure is super complicated, but it's really good to actually break it down all the way. So what we have already said is that acetylcholine was released from the axon terminal of the somatic motor neuron and then acetylcholine binds to the receptors. This curvy area on the muscle fiber is called the motor end plate. It's where all of the acetylcholine receptors are. The reason it's curvy is because that gives more surface area, more surface area, more receptors, more receptors, faster response. So acetylcholine binds to the receptors on the motor end plate, and then if you hit threshold, you get an action potential. The action potential can go both directions, but the action potential is not limited to staying on the surface of the cell because of the T-tubules, the transverse or T-tubules. The T-tubules will allow you to send the action potential deep into the muscle fiber. And you guys may remember that the T-tubules were right next to the lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So look at this picture that we saw last time, right next to the lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when it hits, when the action potential hits the lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, what that will do is it will cause calcium, which was stored there, to be released. And it's released from where? It's released from inside an organelle into the sarcoplasm or cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle fiber. So here we are. Um, we got our depolarizing graded potential moved across the sarcolemma, hit a threshold, hit threshold, and then the action potential was generated, and then it goes down the T-tubules and reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which causes release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There's little weird, um, kind of like um, voltage-gated ion channels, they're called ryanodine receptors or something right here that links the two of them. They put them right here. I don't usually ask you about them in much detail, but basically an action potential here will cause a channel to open there. And um, what happens after the calcium is released is the calcium gets dumped in. And then this is what's ultimately going to allow for um, cross bridge cycling because one thing that I haven't explained to you before is that um, the default state of the actin in a sarcomere is that these actin active sites where myosin wants to bind, those little black dots right there, they are covered by default by a long skinny protein that I consider a barricade. This is called tropomyosin. And tropomyosin, when the muscle is unstimulated, is covering up the actin active sites so that myosin cannot bind to it. But when calcium is present, which should be just after an action potential, calcium will bind to a protein called troponin. Some people say troponin. Troponin. And um, think of troponin as the switch for the barricade. When calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin moves out of the way, and now the active sites are available for binding. So we are here. When calcium is present, it lowers the tropomyosin barrier by binding to it at small fibers called troponin, which we consider the switch. Now the actin active sites are available for the myosin heads to form a cross bridge. And then we can start this process that we already knew. And now we're going to review it one more time. 
So now, after calcium was released, which was after stimulation and after an action potential, what happens is um, the myosin heads can bind to the actin active sites. So you get, again, cross bridge formation, which is free. The phosphate falls off. Power stroke occurs. ADP falls off right here. And I'm stuck here with the, act, uh, the myosin bound to the actin until ATP binds. ATP releases the cross bridge. And then hydrolysis of ATP will actually put it back in the high energy position. And then we are going to do this over and over and over until um, I finish with my contraction. So the whole contraction cycle and the cross bridge process, cross bridge cycling is here again. So now, how am I ever going to allow for relaxation? So how will I get this muscle to release? Well, first off, let's go back here for a second and say, okay, um, you have to stop stimulating the muscle fiber with the axon or the neuron um, before this thing will stop contracting. If you continue to release acetylcholine, it will continue to depolarize, continue to release calcium, and you will continue to have contractions as long as you have ATP and calcium. So the first thing that needs to happen is that you are going to have to stop stimulating it, and then the acetylcholine that was present in the synapse, you have to remove that. And you remove it because there is actually an enzyme that is present on the, on the motor end plate called acetylcholine esterase, acetylcholine esterase. And what happens is right after acetylcholine binds and opens your ligand gated sodium channels and it causes depolarization, then it will bind to acetylcholine esterase and break it down into acetic acid and choline. And choline um, is a B vitamin derivative. You will reuptake that into the presynaptic cell, into the neuron, to use it to make more acetylcholine in the, in the future. Okay, so you have to get rid of the acetylcholine, and that is also in the animation that we were watching. So that's the end part of this. Acetylcholine is rapidly broken down to acetic acid and choline in the synaptic cleft by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. The choline is reabsorbed by the presynaptic terminal and combined with acetic acid to form more acetylcholine, which enters the synaptic vesicles. Okay, so now we took care of the acetylcholine that we released from before, but we're still not relaxed yet. So what is the next thing that we have to do? So if we have no more acetylcholine here, right, then we're not going to get any depolarizing graded potentials, and then we're not going to get any action potentials. So that's all well and good. But what about the calcium that was already released? You have to get rid of the calcium or else the myosin head will keep grabbing for the next actin active site. So the next thing that you are going to have to do is when you finish with contraction, you are going to have to put calcium back where you got it. You're going to have to put it back into the lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the only way you can get it back in there is by pumping it because you store boatloads of this. So calcium must be actively transported back into the SR. So that requires ATP. And then and only then when calcium is pumped back into the SR will the tropomyosin go back into position, its original position here, and then the actin active sites cannot um, be contacted by the myosin heads. And then the actin will slip back into position and the sarcomere will stay relaxed until another action potential arrives. Okay, now I want to point out to you, since this requires some practice, these two should, I hope, work for you. They're two fantastic interactive activities from interactive physiology. You can study the structures of the neuromuscular junction. By the way, when it says activity, it's not passive, it's active. The release of acetylcholine, the action of acetylcholine. And then the next one is excitation contraction coupling, which is watching how it all occurs. 
label the muscle fiber and the sarcomere, review how calcium ions are released, um, review calcium's role, um, all of these things. So it's a fantastic overview and it will sort of stress test whether you understand what we're doing. In addition, we are also going to, when I see you in class, we are going to do a worksheet together in which we actually go through the entire process um, of releasing the neurotransmitter um, all the way to relaxation of the muscle cells. So I realize that this is complicated and it will take practice, but you have several different ways to practice. Okay, we're going to stop this one here.